The other problem that we have, um, I'm just going to refer to the Kruger National Park as um, KMP from now on. So the KMP is a transnational park, there's no borders. So you can actually um, get into, or it's, a, it's so that the, um, the rana can actually run free, uh, or uh, any species for that matter. Um, and uh, so you can approach the, the, the KMP from Mozambique or from, uh, from Zimbabwe. And um, the poacher intrusion rate has increased tremendously. So each day there are more and more um, intrusions and the methods become more violent and cruel, not only towards the animals, uh, but also uh, towards the rangers. So rangers who sign up to be rangers because they love um, animals, uh, they now turned out to be have become soldiers in a in a war. And if you look at the statistics um, on rhino poaching, then you can see that it has decreased. So the 2014 was really the the worst year, and that's more or less also when when we came on board. Um, and yes, the, uh, the the poachings have decreased, but why did it decrease? And one of the reasons is just because um, the resource um, is getting depleted. And it's getting more and more difficult to actually uh, get uh, to, to rhino. So it's not necessarily because of uh, conservation uh, strategies, although we would like to think so. Now, some conservation strategies that actually exist is uh, to immediately dewound uh, orphans. So uh, when you uh, find an orphan next to uh, its mother's uh, carcass, then they have to take the orphans because they're usually so traumatized, they can't uh, survive on their own. Um, so they usually take them to a, a conservation park and they immediately uh, dehorn uh, the orphan. Uh, rhino horn grows back, um, so that's not an issue. And um, it's, it's not, they actually don't use their horn to defend themselves. I don't know why they have the horn, but anyway. Um, it's not, they actually defend themselves when they fight, they defend with their teeth. Um, so translocation of rhino is another strategy, actually uh, to, to countries like uh, the United States and to Australia, and I know they, they plan to do that. I, I don't know if, if, if it actually already started to, to happen. Uh, it's obviously a very, very expensive um, approach and also very dangerous to the animals. And then there's a lot of strategies around education, not only to the local villages around the park, but also uh, to the end user of uh, Brana Wall. So it is a social, uh, a social problem, uh, very much as it is an operational issue. So, but we decided to focus on the operational issues. So we only, uh, uh, we, we scope our problem uh, within the boundaries of the Kruger National Park. So the challenges that we have, uh, pretty, pretty much the same than you, is that we have this a large uh, 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 park, uh, plus minus uh, 1,900 square kilometers, and um, they say that should be 19,000, sorry. Um, they say more or less 1,200 poachings per year, and given the size uh, of the area, that's actually, it results in a very sparse data set. The operational challenges that the rangers have um, are that the poachers enter by foot or they will, someone will drop them off um, in the park um, but they actually, when they hunt for the, the rhino, they hunt on foot because um, it, it is uh, in the wild, you can't really drive uh, with a car and um, they stay in the park for days surveying. So they know exactly what's going on. So they, I mean, that's, that's their job. Um, so they will go into the park, um, they will wait patiently uh, for the right time uh, to, to poach, and they're also opportunistic. They don't know where the rhino are. 
just as uh, even the rangers don't know always where the, the rhino are. Um, because uh, it's estimated that there's between um, a minimum 6,000 and maximum 10,000 uh, rhino um, in the Kruger National Park. So given the size of the park, you can imagine that it is not that easy to find rhino. Um, there is a huge amount of uh, corruption um, in, with, within the, uh, uh, the, rain, the conservation management and uh, the, the rangers in the park. So um, although poachers will maybe not know where to go in order to, to, to find rhino, they will know where not to go in order to avoid rangers if they have um, a corrupt uh, information sources. And then the biggest issue is that the KMP is a tourist destination and you can't aggravate the enemy too much, otherwise they're going to start to target civilians. So it's, it's a, it, there needs to be a balance between conservation um, of animals but also keeping the peace and, and make, making sure that it's still a tourist uh, destination. You don't want to traumatize uh, civilians, but you don't want poachers to start to interact uh, with, with civilians. And this is just another picture to show you a typical uh, uh, safari um, in the Kruger National Park. Um, although this is a private, I can see it's a, it's a private game reserve, but still this is uh, what you do. Sometimes the elephant actually, you know, looks at the, rain, the land rover and will actually attack the land, land rover. I've been in such a situation once. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay, um, so Beijing Networks in a uh, geospatial uh, space. Uh, so when we started off with this project, we had no data, no uh, historical poaching data available that was actually verified that we could use. So we started off uh, by creating an expert-driven or domain knowledge-driven uh, model. And um, we, you know, there are lots of latent variables uh, that experts can understand. For example, um, in our case, a variable like a vulnerability index. Um, it's easy for um, a ranger to understand what is the vulnerability index of a, a, a certain area. And a, a variable like vulnerability index can depend on other factors like, uh, say, the, if the ranger is corruptible, um, if you are close to a main camp or uh, far from a main camp, if you are close to a border. Um, so all of those variables helps you to understand the, the latent drivers uh, for a social problem like uh, poaching. Um, with Bayesian networks, what I always uh, find uh, very handy is that you can add context variables to your Bayesian network, which for me is like switches. Um, so you can switch on, I mean, if you, if you, if the, if you know there's no rhino, um, then there can't be a poaching. Um, if you know there's no poacher, then there can't be a poaching. So if you add context variables like that, if you know there's a, a water uh, or a dam, then probably in that specific area there won't be a poaching because the rhino won't go into the water. Um, so context variables like that is really very handy. Um, and you can train it with expert knowledge and uh, data. Um, and very important, um, and I think all of you can agree with that, that uh, the, the product that you deliver is not only the, the model, it's the whole facilitation process. Um, because all the experts that you include in your facilitation uh, process uh, gets ed educated and you do knowledge transfer. Um, so we always find that uh, the reasoning and the what-if capability of the Bayesian network is so incredibly powerful, especially for young people coming in. Because usually you have these experts that you've, you, know, you know if they should ever 
resign or uh, get hit by a bus, then you are completely lost. There's no knowledge transfer. And Bayesian networks are really uh, very well suited to uh, for this type of participatory uh, modeling. And then um, we can fuse prior knowledge, uh, GIS info and sensor data, where your sensors can be soft or hard, so you can have humans and, because tourists are sensors, and uh, they provide information on a rhino uh, location. And uh, you can fuse all of this knowledge uh, to <coughs> uh, the runtime of the model. So um, let's look at our specific application. Um, so what did we do? Um, so we, the, the whole objective is to generate spatially discrete probability maps. Um, and the maps should identify the areas of high poaching risk. So the output of our model is a probability map that I will show you a little bit later on. And um, the purpose why we want this is to optimize the use of available resources. We always have constrained resources. I think in the uh, Kruger there's something like 400 rangers that needs to cover that whole area. So you need to do resource um, optimization. So we base our model on a criminology theory called uh, routine activity theory, which is very simple but effective. That says in order for a crime to happen, you need to have perpetrator present, a victim present, and the absence of a cap capable guardian. And that is the backbone of our model. So we need a rhino for a poaching. Um, so we, we, that can be one of our sub models to, to, to calculate the probability of a rhino being present in a certain area. And um, then we need uh, the poacher to be present, and then we need the, the ranger to be absent or corrupt. So as we said, it's the absence of a capable guardian. And the Bayesian model consists of two portions. We've got our, what we call the, the causal uh, portion. And the causal portion combines the necessity to have a poacher and a rhino present and a, a, a ranger absent. And it's parameterized using domain experts and actually it's just uh, gates. Um, you don't really need uh, probabilities for that. Um, and then we have the classifier portion, because um, when we started out, we had only expert knowledge, but then later on, we actually got data. So we decided we do want to see if we can build a classifier in order to classify if a poaching event will occur in a, a specific cell or not. And uh, we used the naive base classifier for the simple reason that we could actually put that into the Bayesian network, because you get a naive base uh, structure. And that's what the model looks like. You can see it's Eugen. I know, it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, not to be, I, mean, I like Eugen, but you know, at the Bayesian lab conference, it's weird. Um, so um, this is our historic poaching events. So this is the naive base classified um, part. Um, and the features are all spatially. Um, so it's a uh, distance to uh, closest other poachings, a uh, distance to boundary, a uh, distance to water, uh, the terrain ruggedness, how does the terrain actually look like, a uh, distance to closest main camp, uh, closest ranger post, and distance to closest uh, rhino site. And then you can see that there you have rhino present, there you have ranger present, and there you have poacher present, all feeding into the target node, which is a poaching event. And then the historical poaching event who, that gives you a probability, uh, almost gives you that baseline vulnerability index. And then you implement your switches um, on top of that. So what we did, and I'm, for now I'm only going to focus on the blue part of the model because this is more or less uh, rule-based or straightforward. So um, what we did was to subdivide the KMP into one square kilometer cells. And for each cell, 
uh, we calculate all the relevant covariates, so those are the features, um, the, the leaf nodes, and then we create an instance of the model for each cell. And the Bayesian inference process is then executed for that cell, and an output is generated, which is then your probability of poaching. So um, here you have your map of the, the Kruger. So for each of these cells, we, we create an instance of the Bayesian network, and we calculate uh, the historic poaching event probability. And that results in a heat map like, that looks like this. And um, I'm not really allowed to show you these heat maps. Um, it's a confidential. So this is an old uh, or a heat map based on old data. So I, I would have loved to show you something more visual, but um, I can't do that. And um, because it actually it can actually give give away some information. So once we calculate the probabilities for each cell, then we just uh, normalize the probabilities over the map. And the implementation of the, the, the Bayesian network or the probability heat map is it's currently implemented in a command and control system that is function, function, functional in the Kruger National Park. So it's currently operational. And they use it for long-term trend analysis and positioning of, of sensors. So this is a, a surveillance uh, sensor uh, that is currently implemented in the Kruger. And they only have a few of those sensors, so the probability heat map gives them an indication of where to place the sensors. We don't use it for uh, active tracking because the, the time resolution of our historic data is really, it's maybe a one caucus in three days. And then also you don't know the exact age of a caucus. It could be a week old, it could be an hour. Um, so it's, they can estimate it, but it's really difficult. And um, we also don't have access to tactical information. So, although there are uh, data available on uh, tracks, on puncture tracks, we don't have access to, to that specific data. So, we basically had static data that we could deal with. And if you have static data, then there's not really um, a lot of uh, uh, dynamic, uh, uh, kind of like, you, you can't really make it dynamic, it's, it's going to be artificial. Uh, just something on uh, dynamic data or, so, or temporal data. We, we did look at temporal data, but that basically just uh, scales the probability. So poachers like to uh, poach um, close to uh, or dusk or do dawn, because that is uh, a good, uh, then the helicopters can't uh, pursue them. And uh, they also like to poach uh, in full moon, not so much because they poach in the evening, but because they can go around um, in the park and they can see what they are doing. And they also like to poach close to festive uh, times, like Christmas or Easter or Chinese New Year, etc. So they, those are popular times, but it is basically a weighting of the whole probability, which gets normalized in any case. So, um, I don't know how I'm looking for time, uh, but what's time? Oh, okay. <laughs> In that case, I'm, I'm, I just want to say something about the evaluation metrics. So, the fact that we have so many more so, uh, cells than samples makes it really difficult to do an evaluation. And the output is a probability, so we're not trying to classify. So you can't use a confusion matrix or any other classification metric because that's not really helpful. So it's the problem that we have is uh, if we try to use something like the, uh, the lock likelihood, um, then cells with low probabilities um, containing samples um, 
So when a cell has a low probability, but it contains samples, it's penalized significantly uh, owing to that log feature. So you have this analog of a false alarm that does not get penalized. So we are currently still working on looking at how to properly evaluate the model. And I think I, I got many ideas on how to do that here. Just to show you, if you have a more expressive uh, model, it gives you the blue line of uh, lock likelihoods. But that gets penalized more than this green model that doesn't really have a lot of expressive power when it comes to uh, the probabilities. So we looked at the distance metric. And basically what I did was, um, if you look closely, if you squint your eyes, you can see the outline of the, of, of the Kruger. So what I did was I took the top 10% probabilities of the probability heat map. And those are the, the pink and the red dots. And the blue triangles are observations of poachings. And then I looked at the distance between the, the closest um, high probability and uh, an observation. So there you can see that red probability is the closest to that observation. And if I take something like that, there's many distances that you can use. I use the Euclidean distance because I work with a one square kilometer cell, so it made sense. Then it means that if you have if you use this probability heat map and you have resources for 10% of the park, then you will make an average distance error of 1.95. Whereas this specific model, which was the expert model, if you do exactly the same, then your average uh, distance measure uh, is 8 kilometers. So that was one way to actually evaluate the model in terms of uh, optimizing resources. So to know this is the type of error that you will make if, if you can afford 10% uh, resources to be sent out um, in the park. Uh, but I've got many future work. I should add here uh, implementing Bayesian Lab. And um, we definitely want to look at other uh, alternative classification methods, um, specifically Gaussian processes or uh, Krieging, uh, Krieging, as it is known, which is by the way a South African uh, invented method. It's named after a person, Dani Krieger, that's why it's called Krieging. And um, you know, I still look at point processes um, to better feature selection and um, Look at smaller areas and also non-uniform cells, because it doesn't really make sense to, to have your grid just in square kilometer cells. It's not a natural um, uh, manifest. And uh, when it comes to evaluation, um, we want to look at the Paul McGonough uh, Smirnoff test, which is a really good uh, non-parametric test. Uh, to test if your if your data actually or if your model matches your data uh, behavior. And yes, so this is a, we hope that that's not how our children will get to know Rhino without horn. And then I just quickly want to show you. A video, but I don't know how to get out of the, the presentation. Okay, I was just not persistent enough. Sitting in rhino heartland. In this area, a third of the world rhino grazes. And what we see is because there's so many rhino, there are an incredible amount of poachers.
this park we talk of 2 million hectares of land bordering two countries. Hence, we need partners like Peace Parks, UK Lottery, landowners here, our neighboring countries to work together in order to be able to contain the onslaught. You need human intelligence, but you need technology intelligence. The aim of the system is to try and give us persistent surveillance day and night. And the postcode Meerkat is about being at the forefront, really, of, of technology, of, of pioneering, of innovation, and that's where we need to be. The wide area surveillance system is a radar system that uh, detects movement on a map and plots that movement. Then we need to classify those things to say which of these are people and which of these are animals. And for that we make use of the electro-optical camera system. Once we've done that and we've got a position on the, on the poachers, a specific uh, latitude and longitude, we can call in a reaction unit either by a helicopter or by a road. so large, this technology really assists us in saving these rhinos and apprehending illegal poachers. This was designed to give the rangers a proactive advantage against poaching. It's almost like the, the angel on your shoulder that can see when you cannot see. And that makes it a lot safer for the ranger. If we want to save rhinos, we need to keep our rangers safe. When I saw it standing there, I was like, wow, this is happening in my lifetime. This is a big step in nature conservation. We have designed it as a mobile system. The whole system can fold up, fit on the back of the truck and be unloaded by a small team in a short time. It is also designed complete with hooks so you can hang it, you can sling it under a helicopter. But the meerkat can be moved and deployed where it is relevant. That way it can make an impact. In the case of Kruger National Park's intensive protection zone where 5,000 rhino occur, you can basically cover half of that area with three or four units. And that's the dream, that's the objective. This is one tool in their toolbox to help them. And we mustn't forget that, but it's going to be an important one. To save the rhino. That is really our big play. I'd like to thank every single player of the People's Postcode Lottery because without you, these differences just wouldn't happen. Thank you so much to the players of the UK People's Postcode Lottery and to the Postcode Lottery family. Your support has been invaluable. Thank you very much.